Aloha. Aloha. Welcome, Welcome to worship at Central, Central Union, Union Church. Church. My, My name is Gina. My name is Joe. Have a great day. Have a great day. Thank you. Aloha and welcome to Central Union Church. No matter who you are, what your background or history or where you are on your journey of faith, you are welcome here among us. Friends, can you believe it's already mid-September? The weeks are flying by, but today is a day to celebrate and remember because we have some good news to share. In our in-person service this morning, we welcome some new members. You just saw them on the screen. Dr. Trung Lee and Dr. Gina Bien. Whenever we have new members joining our Ohana, we remember and recognize that commitment isn't a one-way street. We as the fellowship of the church are also called to participate. We're called to support and participate in the lives of Dr. Lee and Dr. Bien. And so this morning, I'd like to invite you church to answer a question and help welcome them to the church. I ask you, do you promise to, to help welcome and to love Trung and Gina? And do you promise to encourage them and hold them in your prayers? If so, say or type, we promise. I see some, some we promises coming in. That's wonderful. Trung and Gina, I know you normally attend our, in, our online church, and so I trust that that you'll be looking back at this. So welcome to Central Union again. We are so happy to have you as a part of our Ohana. Church, help me to welcome them and share your aloha. Last week, we jumped into a new sermon series called Waiting for the Light to Change. And as Pastor Brandon shared, this sermon series began with a question for us. What do you do when you're stuck at a red light? Think about that for a moment. When you're stuck at a red light, what do you do? Or, or where does your mind go? We asked our worship planning team and we got some really interesting answers. And so I'd love to hear from all of you. What do you do when you're at a red light? You can share in the comments or chat section if you'd like. Maybe you, you tap the steering wheel. You're just so ready to go that you tap, 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 tap until the light turns green. Or maybe you fiddle with the radio and, and try to find the perfect song. Maybe if you're like me, you have that awful pull to, to pick up and check your cell phone. Maybe you primp in the mirror or you dance to the music. Maybe you're single and you, you check out the neighboring cars to see if one of them might be holding your soulmate. Or maybe you do, are the opposite and you do everything that you can do to avoid that awkward moment where you catch someone else's eye and you don't know whether you wave or just sort of look away. When you're at a red light, just waiting for it to change, we're in a weird in-between space. We can't really do anything, right? It can feel like an eternity because in that moment, we aren't in charge. We have no control. We just have to wait. And so it's a, a sort of transitional moment, a moment in the middle. Of course, waiting at a red light is just a small thing. But I think it's a microcosm of the larger moments of transition in our lives. We experience the same antsiness, that same urge to do something, to go, right, to be in control in the bigger moments of our lives and in the life of our community of faith. One of my seminary professors, Dr. Donald Capps, called these moments of in-between living in limbo. The limbo between what was and what will be. And while these moments can be stressful and challenging, he was convinced that it was in limbo that the greatest moments of growth can happen in our lives. He believed we are most open to the wisdom of God and of others, that we can most tangibly experience the movement of the spirit in those in-between places. And because living in limbo lets us more clearly hear the call of God, when we move out of that in-between space, we often end up heading in a direction that was entirely different than what we expected. Over the next couple of weeks, we'll be looking at characters in scripture who experience this phase of limbo in their lives. 
in the middle of their stories. Moments in the middle that changed the entire trajectory, not just of their lives, but of who they are. Last week, Pastor Brandon helped us to reflect on the story of Joseph, who was betrayed again and again and ended up in prison, in limbo. Yet still in that moment, Joseph chose to use his gifts to bless others. And today we'll look at the character of Moses. Moses had a complicated past before he got into the middle, into that in-between place. So we'd like to share a fun video with you now that helps to fill in those early pieces of Moses' life. May God be present with us in our worship. The book of Exodus. It's the second book of the Bible, and it picks up the storyline from the previous book, Genesis, which ended with Abraham's grandson, Jacob, leading his large family of 70 people down to Egypt. Now, Jacob's 11th son, Joseph, had been elevated to second in command over Egypt, and he had saved his whole family in a famine. And so Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, offered the family to come live there as a safe haven. And so eventually Jacob dies there in Egypt, and Joseph and all his brothers do too. About 400 years pass, and the story of the Exodus begins. Now that name refers to the event that takes place in the first half of the book, Israel's exodus from Egypt. But the book has a second half that takes place at the foot of Mount Sinai. In this video, we'll just focus on the first half, where centuries have passed, and the Israelites were fruitful and multiplied, and they filled the land. Now, this line is a deliberate echo back to the blessing that God gave all humanity back in the Garden of Eden. And it reminds us of the big biblical story so far. Humanity forfeited God's blessing through sin and rebellion, and so God chose Abraham's family as the vehicle through which he would restore his blessing to all the world. But the new Pharaoh does not view Israel as a blessing. He actually thinks this growing Israelite immigrant group is a threat to his power. And so just as in Genesis, humanity rebels against God's blessing, so here Pharaoh attempts to destroy the source of God's blessing, the Israelites. He brutally enslaves them in forced labor, and then he orders that all the Israelite boys be drowned in the Nile River. Now, Pharaoh, he is the worst character in the Bible so far. His kingdom epitomizes humanity's rebellion against God. Pharaoh has so redefined good and evil according to his own interests that even the murder of innocent children has become good to him. And so Egypt has become worse than Babylon from the book of Genesis. And so now Israel cries out for help against this new Babylon, and God responds. God first turns Pharaoh's evil upside down as an Israelite mother throws her boy into the Nile River, but in a basket. And so he floats safely right down into Pharaoh's own family. He's named Moses, and he grows up to eventually become the man that God will use to defeat Pharaoh's evil. Go down, Moses, way down in Egypt's land, tell old Pharaoh, let my people go. When Israel was in Egypt's land, let my people go. Oppressed so hard they could not stand. Let my people go. Go down, Moses. Way down in Egypt's land. Tell old Pharaoh. Let my people go. When they had reached the other shore, let my people go. Then let the song of triumph soar. Let my people go. Go down, Moses, way down in Egypt's land. 
than alone. Pharaoh, let my people go. Lord, help us all from bondage flee. Let my people go. And let us all in Christ be free. Let my people go. Go down, Moses, way down in Egypt's land, tell old Pharaoh, let my people go, tell old Pharaoh, let my people go. I was asked to summarize Exodus 2, 11 through 22. So I've written a slightly poetic version of those verses. And then we'll pick up the story reading from Exodus chapter 2, 23 through 25 to chapter 3, 1 through 6. One day after Moses had grown, he saw his people working as slaves. Forced labor to him was unknown. He saw an Egyptian beat a Hebrew who he knew was kin to him. He looked around and killed the Egyptian, then found sand to cover him in. The next day, he saw two Hebrews fight when he asked why. One Hebrew said, who gave you the right to rule and judge us? Will you kill me like you did the other because I've made a fuss? Moses now knew his secret was out if Pharaoh heard of it, there was no doubt. In Moses' mind, it was time to flee. So he settled in the land of Midian, where he sat beside a well and felt free. A Midian priest had seven daughters. They came to that well to fill their flock's trough with water. Shepherds scared the girls away, but Moses defended and helped them. Their father asked, why are you home early today? We were attacked, then an Egyptian came to our defense. He drew water and gave it to our flock. This man who saved you from this offense, you must invite him to come break bread. Moses stayed with the priest who gave him his daughter Zipporah to wed. This woman to whom Moses gave his hand gave birth to a son he named Gershom, meaning Moses was a foreigner in their land. Continuing from the scripture. After a long time, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned under their slavery and cried out. Out of the slavery, their cry for help rose up to God. God heard their groaning and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God looked upon the Israelites and God took notice of them. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. May these words give us insight into God's will.
Thank you so much, Marion. Church, pray with me. God of change and of goodness and of glory, you are present here among us, already working in our hearts and in our minds to help us to listen for the word you have for us today. So we pray that you would blow through this space and help us to hear you. Help us to listen for the whisper between the words. In Christ's name, amen. The story of the call of Moses at the burning bush has captured the imaginations of artists, of authors, filmmakers, storytellers, and people of faith for generations and generations. It has been animated, painted, sculpted, dramatized, and preached, and preached, and preached. I bet most people here have seen some kind of image of, of the burning bush, some kind of representation. Maybe it was a stained glass window or, or a painting. Maybe you saw Charlton Heston's movie, The Ten Commandments. Or maybe you saw the newer DreamWorks box office hit, The Prince of Egypt from 1998. That's my personal favorite. I use this sermon as an excuse to watch it twice this week. But how many of you have seen some kind of image or, or dramatization in, of the burning bush before? Share that in the chat and, and where you saw it. And it's not just an interest, it's not just that this is a really interesting story or, or image. I mean, it is, but there are lots of interesting stories in scripture. So why is this story in Exodus 3 so important? Why do we hear it and see it so often? I believe that it's because this story begins the life-changing tale of the Exodus, which is probably the most important and, and most central event of the Old Testament, perhaps even a most central event of scripture altogether, because it's the first place, it's one of the most critical events that teaches us about the heart of God. Everything in Judaism and in Islam and in Christianity Everything finds its foundation in this story. And it all centers around one man, Moses. As Marian shared, he was a man with a, a conflicted and controversial past. He was born an oppressed Israelite in Egypt, but was saved from Pharaoh's wrath by the quick thinking of his mother and sister Miriam. He's discovered and adopted by Pharaoh's own daughter, who raises him as her child. So he presumably lived a life of luxury, of privilege and of plenty. All the while, just outside his doors, his own people were enslaved, beaten and oppressed. Their lives slowly stamped out under the weight of brutalization. And as Marian shared in her summary, Moses at some point in his life discovered that he didn't truly belong in Pharaoh's house, that he shared his blood and his ancestry with those people wailing in pain outside. One day he couldn't take it anymore. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew and he looked around to make sure no one was looking. And then he killed the Egyptian. But as it turns out, someone did see him and he had to flee to a place called Midian. Now we can argue all day long about whether Moses was justified in his actions to kill the Egyptian. And of course it's complicated, right? But at the end of the day, our main character, our main good guy, doesn't have as spotless a record as we often like to paint him with, right? Moses is a murderer. And he's not just a murderer. He's a murderer who acted with intent. The scripture is clear. Moses looked around to make sure no one was watching. And then he killed the Egyptian. He wanted to be sure he wouldn't get caught. And yet he was. And as a result of his brash actions, he became an outlaw. And then he chose not to face the consequences of his actions. Instead, he ran. He ran away. He ran hard and he ran far until he was well out of Pharaoh's grip. And his people, 
he left them behind to fend for themselves. When you think about it, it's, it's really not a great look for Moses, right? Because there's nothing in scripture to indicate that Moses ever had plans to return to Egypt. The text doesn't say anything about it. I mean, it's possible he, he dreamed about it, about his life and his family and his friends he left behind. Maybe he even hoped that they'd forget someday, right? And that he'd be able to go back. But even though he was a stranger in a strange land, he gives no clear indication that he actually had plans to return to see or to help his people in any way. And in fact, we see the opposite. He began to build a life for himself in Midian. He got married. He started a family with, with a child. He began to work with and for his father-in-law in their, their family business. While life wasn't, sh surely it wasn't as cushy as what Moses experienced in the Egyptian palace, it, it sure didn't sound half bad in Midian either. And so that brings Moses to the middle point of his life, to the limbo point of his story. Though he likely didn't know he was in limbo, Moses had settled in, and he's doing what sounds like his ordinary daily task of watching his father-in-law Jethro's flocks. Now, if you're a student of scripture, you may know that tending to the flock can be a dangerous occupation. And I am not talking about the wild animals that might come for the sheep or, or for you. Over and over in the Bible, different shepherds are out tending their flocks when all of the sudden, out of nowhere, they encounter God and it results in a radical change of their lives. David was a shepherd tending flocks when Nathan found him and called him king, called him to be the king. And the prophet Amos was a shepherd when God called him to, to leave his business and to go and instead become a prophet, which was a hard and, and hated life. And of course, there were the shepherds in the New Testament, right? Who the angels appear to. They're minding their own business when all of a sudden the sky is full of angels and send, they're sent to see the newborn king and their lives are changed forever. Shepherding is a dangerous job if you just want to live your life without interruption, I think. And yet again, in this story of Moses, it's in that mundane situation that God chose to be revealed. For as Moses was walking, something catches his eye in the distance. A light, a fire in a bush. It's probably not too uncommon, right, in such a dry area. But there's, there's something strange about this fire. It's not quite normal. The fire isn't burning up the bush. It's just kind of hanging out there. And in that moment, Moses had two options. He could keep going. He could keep on going. And his sheep, you know, they probably didn't care about the bush. They're doing their own thing. So why throw a wrench in his day by going out of his way, right? So he could keep going or he could stop. He could hike over or, or up to figure out what in the world was going on with this bush. It's a little extra work and it, it might mean his sheep can't follow quite easily, but he could do that. I'm sure Moses didn't realize the gravity of this moment of this choice that he would make because it would alter her in his entire life. And isn't it interesting that God gave him a choice? Isn't it interesting that when God set a bush ablaze, God didn't choose a bush right in front of Moses? And God didn't choose a bush that, that Moses and his sheep were just going to happen upon in their daily walk. Surely there wasn't anything particular about the bush that God did chose, choose, except that in order to get to it, Moses had to choose to free himself from the tyranny of routine and hike over to it. But Moses' curiosity, it was piqued. He needed to know north more. He wanted a closer look. And so he took the time to stop and to go and see that wondrous sight. That choice, that decision to step off the 
regular old mundane path and follow his curiosity, that choice made all the difference. In fact, it changed the course of the people of God for all time. You and me, our church and, and all churches, we continue to know and to see the effects of that simple decision by Moses, that simple decision to indulge his curiosity. For when Moses followed his curiosity, it is only then that he encounters the living God. It is only after Moses follows his gut that he finds himself on holy ground. Only with that curiosity does dialogue with the God of his ancestors become possible. Only with curiosity does dialogue with God become possible. Church, I dare say that we, like Moses and Midian, are in a limbo space. COVID has brought us into our own Midian. We're in a weird and an uncomfortable spot. We don't like it, or, or at least I don't like it, because this past year and a half has made it abundantly clear to us that we are not in control. I'm sad to say that we aren't. We aren't in control of our health. We aren't in control of our society. We aren't in control of, of what other people do or don't do. We aren't even in control of our church. We are wandering in the wilderness, just trying to make sense of what has happened and trying to do our best to settle things down and plan our next steps. We, like Moses, are trying to create new routines for ourselves. Perhaps we, we hope to one day return to the things to the way that things were, to return to our Egypt, to reclaim our spot as one of the largest churches with, with the most programs on Oahu. But my dear friends, it breaks my heart to tell you that the road ahead for us is different than the one that lies behind. And what happens to us now, where we go from here, it depends on our willingness and on our commitment as a faith community to stepping off the path of the mundane that we're trying to create for ourselves. It depends on our desire to set aside routine and open our eyes to watch for the burning bushes that God is laying just on the edge of our sight. The story of Moses in the middle, it bids us as a church to be curious, curious of the world around us. I do believe that God is at work in the things that we know and that we expect, but I also believe that God is at work in much deeper ways, in things we don't know, in unconscious things. Sometimes God lies off the path of, of what we used to do or even what we do now, and we must be willing to follow our instincts to get a closer look. I wonder if we trusted our guts and we fully engaged our curiosity, what questions might arise about our church? How might they prepare us for the road ahead? How might they prepare us for our new minister? How might those curiosities change our tra trajectory just like they did Moses's and so many others in scripture? It's kind of scary to think about, isn't it? Sometimes we don't want our trajectory changed. But how might engaging our curiosity help us to see and to know the path to which God is calling us, even if it's different? If we truly trusted our curiosity and if we truly trusted the curiosity of our siblings, of those around us in our church, if we trusted those as equal to our own, what new voices and new ideas might come to bear? What new mission needs might we notice? And what new ministries might emerge blazing with enthusiasm and with care? We've already seen some new ministries emerge during this time because people indulged their curiosity and their, their desire to help. Ministries like Serving Aloha, 
which started with a simple idea and which has blossomed into something beautiful and sacred, something that points to our identity as a people of God. And we've seen people indulge their curiosity and begin a, an expansive ministry of care. It's expanded to include folks who, who write cards to a variety of church members, people who bring meals, people who are visiting our veterans, all of these things birthed from the minds and the visions of church members who listened to the pull of the spirit, who watched what God put on the outskirt of their view. Surely there are more ministries that God is calling us to trailblaze. What curiosities do you have, do we have as a church? Friends, my prayer for us is that we may be a church a people who go out of our way to explore, that we would be a church that experiments just for the sake of what theologians call holy play. May we listen and watch for the things that God is already doing among us, for the ways that God is grabbing our attention and calling us off the path of the usual. May our eyes be open and our feet be ready to move, that we may be ready to do God's will, to bring justice and peace and compassion. And may we be willing to sacrifice, to sacrifice all that we have been, all of our habits and patterns, our narrow-mindedness and our, our comforts, that we might sacrifice all that we are so that we can come into the very presence of God and forge a new path ahead together. Amen. provide the fire I'll provide the sacrifice you provide the spirit I will open up inside you provide the fire the sacrifice you provide the spirit
Aloha from Salem United Church of Christ in Denver, Colorado. I'm Pastor Russ Kirby. To my Central Union, Ohana, Ian and I love you and we miss you. And we're so honored to be here with you today. Thanks to Pastor Brandon for inviting me to come and share in this invitation to the table with you. Your table may be in a sanctuary on an island in the Pacific. It may also be like this one in a sanctuary near the Rocky Mountains. More than likely, wherever you are, it's a dining room table or a desk or a chair at home. It might even simply be here in your heart. Wherever your table is, in this time of communion, it is Christ's table. You'll probably remember during the Last Supper that John and Peter were there, and so was Judas. And none of them were perfect, but all of them were welcome. I invite you, whoever you are, however you are, to this table, to this time. As Connie plays some of her beautiful heart music, now is the perfect time, if you've not already done so, to go to your pantry and take out for whatever may be for you the presence and the essence of Christ and prepare your heart and your soul and your table for this time of communion. Blessings to you. to Russ and to Connie for blessing us this day. Friends, we remember that on the night on which he was to be betrayed, Jesus gathered around the table with his closest friends who had become his disciples. And he took bread. And after giving thanks for it, he broke it and he passed it around to them and said, friends, take and eat this, each of you, for this is my body, which is to be broken for you. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup, and after blessing it and giving thanks for it, he poured it and passed it around to his friends and said, take and drink this, all of you. This is the cup of the new covenant, which is sealed in my blood. Each time that you drink of this cup or eat of this bread, do so in remembrance of me. Friends, we come now in our service to a time of prayer. If you have a prayer request, either a joy or a concern that's been weighing on your heart or your mind, we invite you to email us at prayers at centralunionchurch.org, or you can call the church office and share your prayer with us that way. But that will allow Pastor Brandon and myself to be in prayer with and for you throughout the week and to, to follow up with you to let you know that your church cares for you and loves you. 
At this time, let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Compassionate God who leads, teaches, guides, and accompanies, you offer us compassion and grace in good times and in challenging ones. We know that there are many in our community and around the world who are struggling this day. We lift them up to you in this time and we trust that you are moving in all of our lives, even in those times when we can't see or feel you. And be with us as a church, empower us to hear and respond to cries for justice and peace. For humanity faces so many challenges. Challenges of, of human rights abuses, damage to creation, natural disasters and violence and war, plague in this time, oh God. We especially lift up prayers today for those who continue to fight and battle COVID-19, as well as for those who are caring for them. We know our medical personnel and our first responders are beyond exhausted. They're worn out and frustrated, oh God, yet they continue to give and to give and to give. Holy One, we hold them close to our hearts and we pray that you would renew and reinvigorate them. Help us all to do our parts, oh God, so that we may ease their exhaustion. Bring hope and healing to their hearts. And may they feel your presence coming alongside them. God, we also pray for those who are making decisions about how to best protect the public this day. We know that no matter what decisions they make, they face scorn and criticism, oh God. And so help us to be compassionate and patient. Help us to show grace, God. And we pray for those leaders that you would give them wisdom and, and courage. That you would give them all the tools that you would equip them with what they need to be successful. We know that there are so many obstacles to addressing all of these challenges and the many more that are on our hearts, God. But we also know that you are greater, that your love is, is deeper and wider than we could ever imagine. So cover your children, all of your children in your love and guide us that we may walk beside our local and our global neighbors in prayer and in partnership, oh God. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, the one who taught us to pray together saying, our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, this is the body of Christ, the bread of life, broken for you and for all. Let us share. And this is the cup of blessing, which is poured out for each and every one of us. Let us drink together. Pray with me. God of hope, thank you for meeting us at this table and for sustaining us with your sacred meal. Now send us out to be a people of light and of hope to bless the world around us. In Christ's name, amen. Church, we worship a God of generosity, a God whose giving knows no ending. And God shows us the meaning of generosity in the beautiful diversity of creation, in the overflow, overflowing love of Jesus Christ, and in the never-ending gift of the Holy Spirit. Each one of us here and, and those who aren't here, all of us have been abundantly blessed. 
And we've been called together to be a community that blesses others through the sharing of all that we are and all that we have. And so let us give generously this day so that we can shine the love of God and continue the mission and ministry of our church. There are four ways that you can give. The first is by going to centralunionchurch.org and clicking on Give Now, and that will guide you through the process of giving. Or you can text RISEN to the number on your screen, or you can uh, send mail, send a check by mail. Um, just be sure to put attention accounting on it so it gets to the right place. And finally, uh, serving a, or Foodlands Sir, Give Aloha program. Sorry, I'm all mixed up. Foodland's Give Aloha program is going on all through the month of September. So if you go to Foodland and make a donation using that number, 78511, a donation up to $249, Foodland will match that donation and give that money back to Central Union at the end of the month. So that's a great way to bless us in the month of September. But may God take our gifts and multiply them and um, may, may God's work be done. We have several announcements to share, but before we get there, I'd like to share some words of benediction. Church, may we go out into the world as a people of curiosity. May we turn our eyes towards the places that are darkest, that the places that our curiosity inspires us to look. Let us listen and watch for the things for the people and for the thoughts that are on the periphery that the Holy Spirit is drawing our attention to. Let us be ready and willing to turn aside from our normal routine to encounter the living God. For we will find God in each person, in each thing, and in each place that we go. So let us go now in peace and in courage. Amen. Let's sing together. Beside us, Christ before us, Christ behind us, King of our hearts, Christ within us, Christ below us, Christ above us, never to part. Welcome back, friends. Thanks so much for joining us for worship today. And you may have noticed that Pastor Brandon is missing today. Um, he was here at our in-person service, but he's actually on study leave this week. And so he's been working really hard on the looking ahead at the next year. So I'm here alone for your announcements time. So we better hope especially that there are no birthdays this week so I don't have to sing alone because that would just be painful. We have a few announcements to share. First, this week we'll be back to our uh, regular Aloha Lanai times. And so I believe Devin will be posting those in the chat. So as soon as we're done here, you'll be invited to go to any one of the three of those um, to meet folks, to, to chat, to catch up on your week and to, to uphold and pray for one another. Um, coming up, we have several things. So the first thing is on October 3rd. October 3rd is our annual World Communion Sunday. This is a celebration that's, that's interdenominational and takes place around the world. Thank you, Devin. World Communion Sunday, October 3rd. And we're going to try something new in the name of, of holy play that I talked about in today's sermon. We're going to try a different way of meeting that day. It won't change a whole lot for you, but we're going to meet in Zoom meeting format. Right now we're in webinar format, so you can only see this face. But on World Communion Sunday, you should be able to see the faces of all those who are present in worship, because we'll have many, many little boxes so that you can sort of see one another on that special day when we share in communion and in fellowship with our fellow Christians around the world. So we'll have more information coming out about that with the, the specifics of how to, but the main thing for you to remember is that for that day, there's going to be a different worship link. And that will come out in the e-blast just like normal beforehand. 
and will just be paying special attention because you'll use a different meeting code just for that one day, a different link, just the one day, then we'll be back to using this one that we're on right now. Um, thank you, Devin. So also on World Communion Sunday, that's actually in the Catholic Church and in, in other traditions, that's the day that we celebrate the Feast of St. Francis. St. Francis was the patron saint of animals. And so traditionally we do our pet blessing ceremony on October 3rd. And so um, on October, before that actually, by September 28th, we are inviting you to send a picture, a photo of your pet or pets. And you can send that to Kristen-Young at centralunionchurch.org. Devin will be putting that in the chat. Send us a picture of your pet because we'd like to include them in our pet blessing portion for the online service that day. And if you want to include your pet's name, that's especially great too. So send the photo and the name to Kristen-Young at centralunionchurch.org so that we can celebrate all of our pets. And if you're going to be at the in-person service that day, you can bring your pet with you. And you'll have to sort of hold them up like Simba from the Lion King so that we can bless all the pets at once since we can't gather after the service. But we hope that you'll join in that wonderful celebration for us because pets are people too, as the old saying goes. Um, and uh, I think the last announcement I have is, is one that I mentioned at the beginning, but if you joined us late, we had two new members join us today. And so we just want to extend our aloha again to Dr. Trung Lee and Dr. Gina Bien Lee. Um, welcome to them. We are so glad that you're a part of our Ohana and it's, um, it's such a wonderful gift. It's amazing because um, they found us through our online service and only started coming to church um, because they joined our online service in this COVID time. So that's been a special blessing of this time. Our stories like these and we are so glad that you are with us. Thanks, Devin. And I think, I think that's all. Unless Devin, do you think of any more announcements? Devin is the, the hidden black box that you all can't even see, but he's here with us faithfully each week. All right, he says no, no news from him. So happy birthday to all the birthdays out there. I know there's been some anniversaries I've seen this week as well. So happy anniversary to those who are celebrating anniversaries or even, even half birthdays or half anniversaries. We celebrate you as well. We don't discriminate here at Central Union. So we pray that you have a blessed week and we will see you again for worship next week. Thanks so much.